again, my name is this, and I'm here to talk about these. This here is my new buddy James, here to help me present today's topic, learning. Wait, wait, just wait. I see you're thinking about leaving, just hang on. It'll be good, alright? James, cover the exit. <sighs> so, right, video games and learning. I know most of us don't sit in front of our games every night to learn things. But games have more potential as teaching tools than most people realize. And they don't even have to be boring games to do it. But before I dive into the topic headfirst, let's start by looking at the state of educational gaming in the mass market. There's been a pretty big divide between games meant to educate and games meant to entertain. Like, larger than in any other medium kind of big. It seems that somewhere along the way in game history, educational games and entertainment games were made into two completely separate industries. So now we have the video game industry and the edutainment, or simulation industry. And they've dug a nice deep trench between themselves and they haven't seen each other in years. The problem is that in digging this trench, both sides gave up something valuable. To a degree, edutainment gave up being fun, while the fun games gave up the opportunity to benefit their audience. But just so we're all on the same page, let's look at the educational games for a moment. For starters, what does it mean to educate? In this case, it means setting out with the goal of teaching someone a specific thing. And that's what educational games do. Games like Math Blaster, Duffer is Dying, and Typing of the Dead, they all take this approach. They're games, yes, but their primary focus is to teach you something. But you know those movies that hold you down and hit you in the face with the point? A lot of modern educational games are like that. Sitting you down with the promise of a good time before smacking you with a lesson plan. And being beaten over the head just isn't very fun. Not how we want to spend our leisure time, is it? Not while locusts are running free. And that Katamari isn't going to roll itself. And really, if we wanted to spend our free time working to learn something, it'd be faster and more effective to just pick up a textbook. Now over in the other camp, we have the fun games. I'm sure I don't need to introduce you to these. They're great, aren't they? But after a long Halo session, when you stand up from the couch, what have you really gotten from the experience? Yeah, you've had fun, but it hasn't really expanded your horizons or enriched your life in any way, has it? So how can we make games educational without sucking all the fun out of them, or substantially adding to development costs? The answer, to enable learning. To facilitate learning, rather than trying to educate. Don't worry, I'm going to explain what that means. Study after study has shown that people assimilate information better when they study topics they're interested in, rather than things they're forced to learn for school or work. You know what I mean. You can't remember the names of all 50 states half the time, but you can draw a map of Middle Earth from memory? Don't be ashamed of it, it's how we are. If we're interested in something, we'll have an easy time learning it. The problem with the educational approach is that it tries to jazz up a topic we just don't care about, rather than trying to get us engaged in the topic and care about it in a personal way. But video games have a huge advantage here. We inherently care about what we're doing when we play games. The enthusiasm's already there, and the game designer just has to channel it. This brings us to my main topic of tangential learning. Tangential learning is not what you learn by being taught. Rather, it's what you learn by being exposed to things in a context which you're already engaged in. For example, consider, say, the movie 300. Clearly, not a film intended to educate, right? Yet just about everyone you know now knows who Leonidas is. The film didn't educate, but it got people interested and it stirred discussion. People were exposed to something they didn't know they were interested in, which is one of the biggest breakthroughs for learning. Some people googled 300 and ended up at the Wikipedia page for the historical Battle of Thermopylae. Others simply thought, hey, Leonidas seems pretty awesome, I'd like to learn more about him, and you, you know, you get the idea. This is what tangential learning is all about. It's the idea that some portion of your audience will self-educate if you can introduce them to topics in a context they already find exciting and engaging. For example, maybe after hours of playing Call of Duty 2, certain shooter fans might decide to read about the campaigns of World War II. Maybe some Dynasty Warriors fans will take time to learn more about conflicts in Chinese history. As for me, thanks to Guitar Hero and Rock Band, I've discovered whole eras of music I never realized I liked. And I spent hours watching documentaries on rock history and reading up on the rock gods of old. And my wife has been very patient with me. I bet most of you can think of a time this sort of thing's happened to you as well. This is easy for games to do, and it costs nothing to the developer. And there are lots of different ways to do it, too. Some of you may wonder, is tangential learning possible in games that aren't historically themed? Yes, it is, and I'll give you an example. This is how tangential learning, barely implemented and taking no extra development time, can serve to introduce players to new ideas. Consider how many RPG fans, who have never gone to Temple, know what the Sephiroth is simply because the Final Fantasy team decided to name a character after it. If just 0.1% of the Final Fantasy audience discovered what it is, then Square just facilitated the learning of 10,000 people. So let's think of some good ways to put tangential learning into action without resorting to history retellings. One way is to follow the Sephiroth example, setting up a little kernel of fact or reference into a game story. But when your game is a giant sea of fantasy fiction, it's going to be pretty hard for your audience to figure out which elements are references and which ones are just crazy shit you made up. So how do you highlight which elements have more to them? You could use the straightforward Xenosaga method and simply make everything referential. Of course, this will take a lot of effort and pre-planning to pull off. Alternatively, you could literally highlight the names of referential things. Effective, but kind of tacky. Personally, I recommend a more subtle approach. For example, I'm fond of games that give information or quotations during loading screens. It's dead space anyway, and it's not like we gamers have anything better to do while we wait, so why not throw something up there for us to read? Another example, if you put objects into your game that are clearly referential, then you can clue the player in that other objects in the game might be references as well. 
So, like, if you include Excalibur as a sword in your game, an obvious reference, then the player might connect the dots and assume that perhaps the Masamune in your game is a reference as well. A really great example of tangential learning opportunities in action are in-game indexes, such as Civilopedia, Mass Effect, Codex, and the recently released Metal Gear database. These are all good examples of games providing players a space to access tangential topics in-game. But that concept could go even further. What if, rather than spending time, money, and storage space developing a Civilopedia-type feature, developers integrated a readily available source of information, Wikipedia? Wikipedia links could easily be implemented into any PC game, and required no development time or disk space. Plus, Wikipedia would allow users to follow their interests from topic to topic in a way that traditional in-game encyclopedias simply never could. Now, these sort of features may sound a little heavy-handed or intrusive, but they won't be if the player never has to use them. Properly implemented, things like the Codex or Civilopedia can add to the depth of the player's experience without making them feel like you're holding them down and bludgeoning them with knowledge. That's the whole point. Enhancing the player experience without getting in the way of the fun. Now, don't think I'm saying that there's anything wrong with old-fashioned fun games. A game certainly doesn't have to be educational to be worth our time. Games, above all, should be fun. But many designers are missing out on a prime opportunity to enrich their audience's lives. This is a chance for developers to extend the player's engagement with their product at very little additional cost. And I hope more developers start taking advantage of it in the future. Games can be more than a mere diversion. When we put down the controller, we should have the opportunity to bring something from our recreation into our lives. By simply exposing players to new concepts, designers can lay the groundwork for learning. And to any of you who are planning to look up what the Sephiroth is after this, you know tangential learning works. Wow, you guys are still here. <laughs> now see, that wasn't so bad, was it? Worth sticking around for? Oh, come on, we can't talk about sex every time. <laughs>